Okay. So, hello and welcome, everyone. Um, today is my pleasure to introduce you, uh, Mr. Avishai Green, even if, I don't know, soon to be doctor. I don't know how long it, it takes, Avishai. <laughs> Mr. for now. Oh, Mr. Okay. Uh, so, Avishai is a PhD student at the Political Science Department of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And his research mostly concerned the construction and the communication of political values in the digital context. And to this regard, today's talk will be about how populists conceive truth and the dichotomy of sincerity versus accuracy, more or less. So I leave it to you for the details, Avishai. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, and thank you for inviting me. Um, this came about by me um, running, coming across uh, the alternative uh, conceptions of uh, honesty paper and uh, corresponding a little bit about it with uh, Dr. Simpon and, and Lasser. And, um, I think you'll see soon um, why um, uh, certainly, I think we're thinking about a lot of similar things. So um, you presented me pretty well, so I won't, um, I think I'll rush through this. Um, just I'll say that I'm working in the political science department, but I'm working with, with the communications department or in the communications department. So I'm kind of in between the two fields. Um, and what I'm actually presenting today uh, for, I have 40 minutes, right? More or less to, to talk. So um, it is um, it's actually mostly things that I was doing um, before in my MA and hopefully at the, at the end, um, if I have a bit of time, I'll talk about what I'm working on in the moment, which is connected, but um, we'll see if we get to that. So let's jump right into it. So um, this um, whole kind of, research uh, started for me, um, as I assume for many people, um, focus did with focus on the rise of Donald Trump and um, motivation being noticing um, the fact that this politician is a liar and in a way that is kind of unprecedented and um, very, very well documented. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, we all know this, but uh, it is quite striking. The Washington Post documented over 30,000 false claims that's during his presidency, which is over 20 a day, which is really very, very impressive. And um, the thing is about uh, these, um, th this um, titling him as a liar is that it doesn't seem to necessarily capture the whole story because the way we usually think about lies is their attempts to conceal some truth and to convince whoever's listening to you that something else is true. We don't usually think that way about statements that are just kind of ridiculous or absurd or, or kind of nonsensical, such as when you said Obama is the founder of ISIS and uh, you know clarified he wasn't being metaphorical. He meant that, wouldn't explain what he meant, but he meant that. Um, lies aren't usually internally contradictory in very obvious ways, such as in saying, uh, complaining that leaks from the White House were real, but the, the, leak, the news in the leaks was false. Um, usually lies are crafted to at least appear coherent. And, and lies aren't usually observably false, um, such as this very, very famous example where basically people were asked to uh, not believe their uh, lying eyes, if you will. Um, and all this has led a lot of people to suggest that what Trump um, was engaged in, is engaged in, is what's called um, bullshit. Um, which is defined uh, by philosopher Harry Frankfurt as statements whose truth value its speaker is indifferent towards. Um, in other words, statements in which you don't don't care if what you're saying is true or not. You might even coincidentally be true, be telling the truth, but but only coincidentally. The point is that you don't care. Um, Frankfurt writes the fact about himself that the bullshitter hides is that the truth values of his statements are of no central interest to him. What we are not to understand is his intention is neither neither to report the truth nor to conceal it. Um, which some of the examples I pointed at, I think would seem to fit with this, was just not really caring about whether it's true or not. And making this connection is something that many people have made. In fact, Frankfurt himself has made it saying in 2016 about Trump, Trump makes statements whose truth is uncertain and he's indifferent to the fact that he doesn't actually regard them as true, it's bullshit. Um, and another um, related term, which uh, many people have connected uh, to Trump, is uh, post-truth. Uh, if you will, bullshit would be um, a characterization of a type of discourse or speech, and post-truth 
is kind of what you get when you have a lot of bullshit. Um, it's a societal condition or a condition of communication in general, which is defined as circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Um, now, um, the thing about um, Trump that many people have connected it to is his uh, populism. And uh, I'll get back to this in a second, but of course, if we're saying that Trump bullshits or is post-truth um, and he's also a populist, he's not alone in any of these things. And in fact, these are arguably two of the most prominent political uh, phenomena of the last uh, decade, the rise of populists worldwide from Brazil to um, in India, uh, Britain, other places that we don't see here, like the Philippines, Hungary, here in Israel, uh, and the list goes on. And the rise of what um, of what people just talk about as, as post-truth. Uh, in fact, the definition I showed earlier was because Oxford named it the word of the year, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And um, importantly, for our uh, purposes, explicitly connected it to populists, to the U.S. election and the EU referendum for Brexit, um, so to populist uh, political um, victories. So um, what I'm getting at is that many people um, seem to think or connect um, that we have these two uh, phenomena happening, populism and post-truth, and um, many people um, seem to to use them almost synonymously, even post-truth populism as a, a term that's thrown around a lot. And what's less clear though, is what the connection is and if it's causal um, rather than you know, correlational or something else. Um, just to um, have a quick definition of terms. So uh, we defined um, post-truth. Um, so populism, um, there are many definitions, uh, it's kind of, pretty contested um, um, term in political science, but, but what I have here is basically what I would call the analytical core, the thing that is pretty widely agreed upon among political scientists, which is that it's a political appeal to the people um, as sovereigns against some demonized elitist other. So what we have here is a both a descriptive claim, that is society is this way, it's divided into these two antagonistic, internally homogenous groups, and it's a normative claim that's saying one of these groups, the people, is good, and it's the true democratic sovereign, and the other group, the elite, is bad. Um, and populism is also often characterized by having strong leader and a direct communication style. Um, now, when we ask if these two uh, things are connected, populism and post-truth, so um, it's not clear from the literature, um, if they are, or or um, or if they are, why that would be. And in fact, um, some research, um, and, and I know you guys are, I'm sure, more experts on this uh, field of research than I am. But um, my reading is that a lot of research on kind of cognitive biases at a societal level um, don't necessarily suggest any political difference, but rather um, would lead us to think that. Um, kind of group think and what's called epistemic bubbles of, uh, of groups would be um, universal and symmetrical for all kinds of reasons that are kind of um, symmetrical across groups. Um, I'm, I'm talking about um, Cass Sunstein's group polarization theory and um, Dan Kahn's politically motivated reasoning paradigm. And um, this leads me to ask, is there a fundamental and non-incidental connection between populism and post-truth? That's the first question. But there's a second question, which is a little bit more uh, complex, but really builds on the first one. And, and that's this. If we accept as a premise that populists, for whatever reason, seem to be characterized by post-truth, that it seem to be to exhibit a lack of concern for the truth, it might follow that the supporters of populists support them despite this fact, that they support them because they support, say, in the case of Trump, his uh, border wall or his economic policies or his business acumen. And that the fact that their commitment to truth is simply a thing that these voters um, just don't place a lot of stock in. It's low on their um, priority list. However, the evidence seems to be, I would say, pretty strongly the opposite of that. In fact, kind of a fixture of interviews with Trump supporters when asked why they support him, one of the first things you hear 
um, and I would argue this is more than anecdotal, it, it shows up so often, is he tells it like it is. Um, and, and this is also backed up by polls. Um, Trump supporters overwhelmingly view him as honest and, um, and overwhelmingly cite that as, as a reason to choose him. And, um, and again, Trump is kind of the, maybe that my springboard here, but, but this is really true um, in a lot of these cases um, that uh, there's a strong populist discourse of telling the real truth, telling it like it is, standing up to the fake and phony and hoax and so on uh, establishment. Um, and, and this would seem to be an anomaly, right? How are these two things um, happen together? Which leads to my second question, what explains populist supporters simultaneous willingness to accept untruths while claiming truth to be important to them? And in the time I have left, I'm gonna to try to both sort of lay out a, a theoretical um, suggestion for why this might be and um, an empirical um, attempt of mine to approach this, uh, which, um, I'll show you what I found and what I didn't find. Um, now, why should we care? I'm, I'm going to go over this quickly because I assume for kind of this audience, uh, I don't need to convince you guys. But but it matters. It matters if they're just lying or if they're um, bullshitting um, or in post truth because lies are refutable, whereas post truth discourse um, isn't. In fact, that that's what characterizes it. It's a discourse in which there there is no um, significance or meaning. Uh, to uh, citing facts and and thus correction is impossible. And at a wider societal level, um, this is very um, destructive to democracy and to democratic deliberation. Um, so um, here's my suggestion uh, for uh, for why these things might be connected. And um, it goes back to understanding what we even mean by the concept of truthfulness in the first place. And what we mean, um, I, I argue here, based on um, some leading thinkers, is that truthfulness is comprised of sincerity and accuracy as two distinct components that um, when truthfulness is, is present, both of these components are, are present, but don't have to be, and in fact, sometimes can come at the expense of one another, as I will argue is the case. And I'm basing this analytical distinction on um, three different leading uh, philosophers um, from different schools of thought, different traditions, though. Uh, Bernard Williams, uh, Jürgen Habermas, and Paul Grice, who's a um, philosophy of language. And they both use slightly different terms to make a distinction, which I think is really very, very similar. So whether they're talking about truthfulness or validity or the maxim of making your contribution one that is true, all three of them say, hey, this um, principle is made up of two different things. Um, one of them is uh, sincerity, um, as both Williams and Habermas call it, or Rice calls it, do not say what you believe is false, right? Um, and the other one is accuracy, or Habermas just calls it truth, by, but he explains, he means by that, is it accurate? So accuracy. And Grace, who's talking in conversational maxims, says do not say that for which you lack adequate evidence. In other words, try to be accurate. So we have this distinction. Truthfulness is both making an effort to actually correspond to reality and being honest about what you feel and, and know um, inside. And what I want to argue kind of in a nutshell is that populism very much valorizes one of these at the expense of the other, valorizes sincerity at the expense of devaluing accuracy. Now, why would this be? Well, accuracy, um, Williams argues, is really the founding value of intellectualism, of science in general, and of um, expertise almost as a concept. And intellectualism, however, is anathema to populists. Intellectualism is synonymous, more or less, with elitism. And populists are very uh, hostile to this. And there are lots of examples of this throughout history from leading populists who tried to hide tried and tried today to hide um, any kind of characteristics of elitism uh, and intellectualism specifically of themselves um, and, and being very um, hostile to it. Um, some you know, strong uh, memorable examples are the Scopes Monkey Trial in the United States about the teaching of evolution in which the um, very, very publicized and, and the leading um, prosecutor or sorry, rather lawyer 
arguing against the teaching evolution was William Jennings Bryan, who uh, ran for president as leader of the populist party several times. And he very much based his argument on attacking this um, elitist intellectualism as, you know, who are you to come into Tennessee and teach us about this theory? Um, there are more examples, but I don't think we have the time. So, um, and, and a, uh, a more contemporary one, which may be familiar to you, to you guys, is in the Brexit discourse, I believe this was Michael Gove, saying the people of this country have had enough of experts. So really a feeling that um, expertise and populism are at loggerheads. And I would argue from here that the value of accuracy itself, of showing your work, of citing um, sources and so on, is very strongly devalued and looked down upon. And the, on the other hand, and, and the reason for this is because populists, it's not that they don't care about um, truth at all, which is what I'm arguing, that, but that they care about a different form of it and a different form of, uh, of wisdom, folk wisdom. Um, as Richard Hofstadter, the historian, writes in his book, Anti-Intellectualism in American Life, um, as he says popular democracy, but he means populism by this, gains strength and confidence, it reinforced the widespread belief in the superiority of inborn, intuitive, folkish wisdom over the cultivated, over-sophisticated, and self-interested knowledge of the literati and well-to-do. And um, that was in the 50s, but it's very, very prominent today in the way that populists tend to think about themselves and tend to, more importantly, perhaps present themselves. So uh, UKIP, describes its ideology as common sense-ism, and the AFD of Germany dubs itself the common sense party, very much appealing to this conception that those eggheads over there have all their books and numbers, uh, but we have the common man's wisdom. And this is very much, um, and since folk wisdom is innate, and it's not something you get from going outside and, and looking in the world, it's something you get from listening to yourself, it follows that what's valued is transmitting that outward. In other words, being sincere and telling it like it is, is a value. And this is the logic that allowed, for example, Donald Trump to um, dismiss uh, approved treatments for COVID-19 and just kind of extemporaneously talk about um, kind of crazy ideas for uh, injecting bleach or, or, uh, or using all kinds of other unproven. And when challenged, you know, what are you basing this on? Saying very explicitly, I'm not a doctor, this is a quote, but I have common sense. So, um, and the corollary to that is, and I tell it like it is, I'm not shy to, to share that common sense with you guys. Um, additionally, um, another factor here is that in populism, as I mentioned earlier, the leader is very central. Um, there's in general populism, um, is very much part and perhaps a driver of the um, phenomena of personal personalization in politics. The figure of the leader is very personal. All politics is personal, if you will. And, um, and it's important for the leader to be seen as authentic and his authenticity, one very prime um, manifestation of that is his sincerity. Um, so all this comes to say is to say that in, in populism, it's very important for the leader to be seen as sincere. So basically the argument is that populism emphasizes sincerity and devalues accuracy. And that this pretty much in, in and of itself leads to not being concerned with the truth. And actually we find this back in Frankfurt himself in talking about bullshit and saying, here he's not talking about populists, he's just talking about the bullshitter. And he says, rather than seeking primarily to arrive at accurate representations of the common world, Right? rather than seeking to be accurate, the individual turns towards trying to provide honest representations of himself, i.e. to be sincere. And later on he says, but when you have sincerity without accuracy, and so far as this is the case, sincerity itself is bullshit. Um, and I would argue this is the answer to my first question and also goes a long way towards answering the second one, because if what you're selling is um, telling it like it is, being sincere but not being accurate, that explains how you can both not be committed to actual truth and saying things that are that are demonstrably untrue, but still see yourself as telling it like it is and be seen that way by others. And I think we see this pretty strongly with uh, Melania Trump, for example, in uh, the 2020 convention, 
saying we all know Donald Trump makes no secrets about how he feels about things. Total honesty is what we as citizens deserve from our president. Whether you like it or not, you know you always know what he is thinking. So this conception of total honesty doesn't mention accuracy or anything like it anywhere near it. It very explicitly is about knowing what he is thinking, being sincere. Um, so this was all kind of a theoretical um, argument. And um, it's actually one paper I wrote. And then there was a follow-up paper in which I tried to empirically test this thesis. Um, so how did I do that? Well, we have really three variables here. The independent variable is populist speech. And my argument is that it should lead to more of what I call appeals to accuracy and less to what less what I call appeals to sincerity. Now, just a sentence here, why am I talking about populist speech and why am I talking about appeals to, um, as opposed to just populism, accuracy, and sincerity? This comes from a conception of all of these things being, and populism uh, uh, especially, being a type of discourse. So it's not that the leader X is populist and leader Y is not populist in a binary way, but rather populism is discourse that carries political messages and thus a leader can be, or anyone can be more populist in one moment, less populist in another moment. And the argument here is really about um, what the type of discourse does. Um, so um, so the first, the independent variable of populist speech, I um, basically just adopted an existing um, measurement from the Global Populism Database uh, study led by Kirk Hawkins from Harvard and a long list of, um, of co-authors, in which what they did was um, took speeches from leaders from all over the world from the last two decades and gave them holistic uh, scoring of the, of the whole speech as populist or not populist or semi-populist. There were a few, a few scores in the middle, but, but um, the holistic scoring at the speech level. Um, and importantly, they took four different types of speeches for every office term for every politician. So you know, for um, Obama's first, um, first term in office, they took one campaign speech, one ribbon cutting speech, one international speech, often at the UN, and one famous speech, which is kind of the most variable category, because that could be all kinds of things. And this is important because it underscores that populism is a discourse type, which is context dependent. We will expect, and we do in fact see that leaders, all leaders are much more populist when they're on the campaign trail and talking to voters, rather when, the, when, the, when they're talking to the UN. And when they're doing ribbon cutting, they're somewhere in the middle. Um, and famous speeches are also kind of all over the place. Um, so my corpus, I basically took um, from their corpus, all the ones that were either originally in English or translated to English, um, which was 179 speeches from 71 leaders across 33 countries, um, which uh, had in, in them over 20,000 sentences. And, um, and I adopted their scores for the populism um, <clears throat> um, variable. Now, as for appeals to accuracy, now, again, why appeals? Well, I don't know if someone's being accurate or not. And in fact, I, I, it's not what I um, care about. What I care about is whether he, the speaker is um, signaling that he is trying to be accurate, right? Right. Um, so it's actually not not important for to us whether he's correct or not, but whether he's using rhetorical tools to signal to other speakers, hey, look, I made an effort to um, to try to correspond to reality. Um, in fact, Boston is the capital of France is a sentence that's wrong, but has an appeal to accuracy because there's something there. There's a fact there that can be um, falsified or checked, whether, whereas hello everyone isn't, is neither true nor false and thus has a very low appeal to accuracy. So I hope this distinction um, is clear. And to measure this, a proxy for it was fact-checked worthiness, whether a statement can and, and is, would be interesting to fact-check it, right? Whether there's stuff there that can be um, tested and verified as true or false. And for this, I used another existing tool called a Claim Buster, which is a machine learning tool that was trained on um, fact checkers who were coded many, many sentences, I think from the 2012 uh, Republican um, debates as um, fact check worthy or not. So is there something to test there or not? <laughs> and um, it's pretty straightforward. You place in sentences like Boston is the capital of France, taxes rose by 75% last year, um, 
hamburgers are good and hello everyone and it gives you a score for how um how fact check worthy they are um i didn't always understand um the exact scores but i can say that uh relatively speaking or ordinarily speaking they, they seem very they seem good to me so um, Boston is the capital of France, as I said, is, is more, um, has a higher appeal to accuracy than hello everyone. And also more than hamburgers are good, which is really just an opinion. There's not really much to check there. Uh, the taxes rose by 75%. Last year is, is higher than anything else because figures are like a prime type of appeal to accuracy. Um, so I, I, I ran um, at the sentence level of the, the corpus uh, through that. Now, the second um, dependent variable was appeals to sincerity, which is, again, not speech that's actually sincere or not, we don't know that, but speech that signals that the speaker is saying what they believe to be true. And this was the main methodological challenge of this uh, work. I, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of anything that did this in a way that um, was satisfactory, so we developed this um, um, ourselves. And, um, we operationalize the appeals to sincerity as basically consisting of two things, speech that re references the speaker's personal mental state, more specifically his beliefs, emotions, and desires, and speech in which the speaker self portrays himself as sincere, which is actually the most straightforward. It's just when the speaker says, believe me, I'm, I'm telling you the truth, read my lips, very explicitly um, trying to present himself as, hey, hey, I'm telling you what I really feel inside. Um, and the way we, we what we did was uh, manual coding based upon which we trained a supervised machine learning model um, to characterize, eventually the goal was to characterize sentences as high or low appeals to sincerity. We wrote a code book, a code book um, and, and saying things such as, um, you know, we're going to code beliefs as um, as uh, statements in which the speaker talks about things that he sees that are an opinion or a viewpoint, but not an objective fact. So I see that America is great as a belief, but I see that the stock market rose. We didn't count that as a belief, because it's just something that you can literally see, um, if that makes sense. But anyway, that's just an example. The point is, is that um, me and a research assistant of Galwan um, went over and coded a lot of sentences um, it looked like this. So a sentence like, so my vision is forbidden, written to be a great meritocracy, didn't get any scores because it didn't have any of these things. But a sentence that started with, I urge more and more um, wealthy people uh, to emulate the spirit. We, we said, this is a desire, which we counted as a type of sincerity. One that said, I'm confident that these elections will be fully free and fair was a belief. And one that said, um, I was happy to see your government is cutting taxes counted as a display of emotion. Um, and um, I mean, a sentence that would have, say, all four of these would be the highest type of appeal to sincerity. And um, if I had only one, it would be somewhere in the middle. Um, so we did several rounds of manual coding, um, updating the code book as we went along. And when we achieved intercode reliability, we trained a supervised machine learning model, um, Roberta Base, if um, anyone is familiar. Uh, which was developed by um, Deep Story Computational Text Analysis Project at Hebrew University um, <clears throat> that I was working at at the time. And um, then we did an iterative process of um, where we took a training set, um, trained um, the model, and then checked the results, and went back and did manual coding each time to make it better. Mostly the coding was random uh, of, these, of these additional rounds. But the last two uh, weren't. We did a um, guided search methodology in which we said, OK, let's just take ones that we suspect as being on uh, the last category of um, self-presentation as sincere, because it's a rarer category. We have a lot of zeros. So let's oversample for that to make sure we uh, get cases. And something that's called active learning validation, in which we took cases that the uh, model coded as uh, the scores it gave us between 0 and 1. So ones that it gave that were near 0 0.5, that were really borderline cases, uh, hard cases, basically by definition, and then we manually coded those and, and refed them back in to kind of uh, hone the model on cases that were that were tricky, that were borderline. Um, and the result was finally we achieved um, high scores, which means we um, there, there was a high uh, degree of agreement between our training set that we manually coded and what the model produced. And when we were confident in that, we used it on the entire data set, which gave us gave us an appeals to sincerity score for every sentence and hence for every speech in the corpus. Um, so finally, we had our three variables. 
the hypotheses were the first two were very straightforwardly what I was saying in the theoretical paper, which is I was expecting the more appeals to populism, then the more appeals to sincerity and the less appeals to accuracy we would find. And the next two hypotheses were uh, a little bit more um, complex and interactive and had to do with the fact that we had here the speech type. And specifically, as I mentioned, campaign speech, we knew ahead of time was going to be the most populist type of speech. So basically my assumption was, well, if the speech is more, pop is more populist to begin with, maybe we'll see an even stronger interaction of the type we're expecting to see. So for campaign speeches, the more populist, the more appeals to sincerity and the less appeals to accuracy. <clears throat> okay, so what did we actually find? So first thing, the first two connections that I was uh, curious about, uh, were inconclusive. Um, not necessarily true, not necessarily false, but um, we didn't find them. But um, we did find actually interesting uh, interaction effects, which pointed, and this is what I, I, said, I would say was the main finding, for the speech type to actually be a significant moderating factor on the types of um, relationships we found. So um, first two columns show results that um, fortunately weren't uh, statistically significant. But the third one shows the interaction of appeals to sincerity with um, the distinction that I made was between campaign speeches, which we knew were the most populist, we knew from the global populism database themselves, um, versus the three types of other speeches, which were all significantly less popular. And what we saw was that for campaign speeches, the more populist the speech, the more that the higher the appeals to sincerity score was. And for non-campaign speeches, we saw uh, an opposite effect. Um, and, and this was actually consistent with what uh, hypo hypothesis three was saying, right? It's this sort of connection I was expecting to see between popular speech and appeals to sincerity playing out, especially in the type of speech that we knew would be popular. Um, However, the appeals to sincerity score, which I was sort of expecting to see an opposite phenomenon, uh, actually we saw a similar phenomenon. So once again, for campaign speeches, the more populist, the more appeals to accuracy we saw, and for non-campaign speeches, uh, the reverse, the more populist, the less uh, appeals to, uh, to accuracy we saw, which is not what I was expecting, uh, was statistically significant. Um, so actually what I ended up finding um, you know, with not uh, this distinction between appeals to accuracy and, and appeals to sincerity, but rather um, similar effects of what I can call together appeals to truthfulness that were very moderated um, by the type of speech. Basically, in campaign speeches, the more populist the speech, the more appeals to truthfulness we found, and in non-campaign speeches, the more populist speech, the less appeals to truthfulness they found. Um, and this is interesting, um, and it's, again, it's not what I was expecting, um, kind of reflecting on it, what it could mean is that, you know, in general, it shows the importance of context, and one way to understand it is perhaps the politicians are attuned to the context in which they give a speech, and they make different instrumental use of populist messaging according to the situation. For example, um, the fact that a populist speech in a non-campaign setting is predictive of not only less facts and figures, appeals to accuracy, which I was expecting, but also, surprisingly at least to me, fewer personal appeals, like appeals to accuracy, maybe it indicates that the speaker feels a need to kind of balance their message in response to their surroundings. Um, if the audience at a forum such as the UN, um, where we, we'd expected to have relatively low receptiveness to populist messages and to personal appeals, Maybe this leads a speaker who does want to give a populist message to, to offset this by restraining their personal appeals. That's just a, an explanation um, under which in this account, we would see sincerity and accuracy as simultaneously as natural outgrowths of the logic of populist messaging as an instrumental rhetorical tool that a speaker can calibrate to match the moment. All that being said though, um, to be honest, this is research I did um, few years ago in my MA, I've been working on kind of different things in my PhD, but I really want to get back to this and um, and rerun it because um, because the corpus has since grown, the global populism database has since grown, and um, I think the tools that we use, um, actually all the tools we use, um, have gotten better, can get better, and um, I, honestly, I'm really curious just to see uh, what uh, we'll get if we, if we do it again. Um, and um, yeah, that is basically it. I uh, I was 
yeah, if I had time, I would I would talk about um, a current project I'm working on, which is different but related. It's about hypocrisy appeals, but I see I'm pretty much getting directly to the 40 minute mark. So maybe actually, uh, I think I'll I'll stop and leave us time to uh, to talk about this one. Um, so thank you guys for listening. Thank you very much, Avishai. Uh, that was very interesting. And actually, I think there will be time for you to go back to the, the slides that you jumped. But let's go to the okay. discussion now. And so, and so let's check if we have some few minutes left. So thank you very much. And yeah, we're let's open the discussion. Thanks, Bob. Kia. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, that was very interesting, especially because my own PhD work is in a very similar vein. I am looking into perceptions of truth and specifically sincerity and accuracy. Um, you mentioned in one of the slides this question about whether populism would be fundamentally linked to post-truth, but you didn't actually really go back at that. I was just thinking, uh, because populism as a notion it is not brand new, whereas post-truth is something that we sort of mainly discuss as a the 21st century issue. Um, so what are you, your views on that a little bit more, maybe? Like, do you think that populism is fundamentally linked to post-truth? And then another thing is that for your definition of sincerity, uh, am I correct in understanding that you quite heavily rely on the um, sort of the bullshit definition of it, that sincerity essentially cannot, cannot well, no, maybe not cannot, but does not tend to contain elements of accuracy? Or have you considered the possibility that even someone who appeals to sincerity can perhaps use numbers and figures to sort of uh, solidify their arguments? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I'll take these one at a time. Yeah. Um, so, so the first one was, do I think that these are connected or not? And then the short answer is, yeah, I, th I think they do. I mean, my, my attempts to kind of prove it um, haven't uh, panned out yet, but that doesn't, yeah, I, I think I think they are. And it's true that you're right, that populism has been around for a long time and post-truth is kind of a new concept. Um, but um, that doesn't mean it actually um, is new and bullshit certainly isn't new, right? Yeah. <laughs> What's what's arguably new is kind of how widespread it is, and, and that's what I take, you know, at a very general level, that's what I take post-truth really mean, this kind of idea that this is not, this is no longer just something people do, but it's a societal condition. So, okay, maybe that's new, but if, if so, it's correlated, or arguably it's correlated to the fact that populism is having a moment or has been having a moment. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so yeah, really short answer is uh, certainly I don't think that populism is the only thing that causes people to not tell the truth or anything like that. But um, yeah, I, I, my argument in um, really one sentence is that there is a fundamental logic of populism that leads to a lack of uh, concern with factual truth. Now, as for your second question of whether sincerity, um, let me see if I understand the question right. Do I think that sincerity um, is necessarily without accuracy or, um, or or can it be with accuracy? So no, I think um, my reading of, of Bernard Williams and, and um, Habermas and Grace is they're saying these things should co go together. When we talk about truthfulness, we want to have both sincerity and accuracy, but, but the important analytical point is that these things are, are, are different and uh, thus they don't have to come together. Um, I don't. I said, certainly don't think that they they have to be at odds. Um, uh, I think you know, in general, I think everybody has different differing degrees of, of both of them at different times. Um, the argument is that populism has, um, for reasons of kind of the internal logic of it, it has a much stronger tendency to uh, to one and and not towards the other, and that this has an effect on on the discourse, and and I would argue even on the uh, conception of, of truthfulness, which um, which is very similar to uh, to the alternative conceptions of honesty kind of way of looking at it, which is why I was so interested in that paper. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Steve, I believe, was first, and then Alan. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, a lot of very familiar echoes to, to things we do as well. 
I want to make a um, <clears throat> couple of comments. Uh, the first one is you said the bullshitter doesn't care about the truth and to them it's all the same. And I totally get that. And I think that's a very common thing for people to say. Now, what is interesting in this context is that you can actually classify Trump's tweets as being accurate or inaccurate on the basis of linguistic properties with fairly good accuracy. There's a bunch of models that have done that. And I'm putting a link to a preprint in the chat that um, is surveying some of that literature and has some references in that. Um, and by the way, that preprint is a weird sort of, we're hiding it in broad daylight. It's up there, but we haven't tweeted it yet and we're trying to minimize attention to it until it's been published and accepted. It's currently under review. So, but we have to tell the journal uh, that we preprinted it. So we have to put it up there even though we don't want it <laughs> spread on social media just yet. So um, feel free to read it, but please don't tweet it. The moment people start tweeting it, we're going to have to start debating it, and we're trying to postpone that. Okay. Anyway, um, that's just a by the by. There's that out there. The second comment I was going to... Well, so anyway, I'd like to comment on, on that, the fact that you can actually tell when Donald Trump knows he's lying. Um, which doesn't quite, to me, doesn't quite sort of mesh with that bullshit idea or the idea that bullshitters don't know what they're doing or don't care. I mean, they care enough to no, sound different, seemingly. So that's one thing. The other thing is um, following on from what Kia's question about whether sincerity is necessarily linked to inaccuracy. Um, we can answer that <clears throat> quantitatively. I don't know if you're familiar with the paper that Jana Lasser was first author on last year in Nature and Human Behavior. We did a large-scale computational analysis of um, tweets by uh, American Congress people. And we found that there was a relationship between increased sincerity and decreased in accuracy, but only for Republicans, not for Democrats. Um, and so the conclusion we drew was that basically being sincere is a gateway towards inaccuracy, towards misinformation. But you have to choose to avail yourself of that. And so, um, and in this case, it was only Republicans who chose to do that. Democrats didn't. And that may answer that question to some extent that, you know, sincerity isn't necessarily an indication of misinformation, but it can be. By contrast, accuracy, what we call fact speaking, is never a marker of misinformation, at least not in American public discourse. So the, the, there is a sort of a distinction, but it's an interaction. And I'll leave it at that, just for you to comment on. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't have much to comment on. I mean, the first the first comment you said, I'm not familiar with the paper, so I'll have to look at it. Um, I don't know if this answers your question. The claim certainly isn't that um, Trump, specifically, or populists in general, are, are always bullshitting or anything like that. But um, but yes, the claim is that there are certainly many examples in which it doesn't seem that they um, care about um, the truth. But maybe maybe your, your paper or the paper you're, you're pointing to says otherwise. So I'll have to look at it. I mean, just as an example, you know, I gave the example of um, Obama as the founder of ISIS. So um, memorably to me at the time, um, you know, he said that there was a firestorm for a few days. People got mad. And then he gave an interview to a very sympathetic uh, right-wing um, radio personality, Hugh Hewitt, and, and very clearly the, person, the guy, Hugh Hewitt, was trying to help him out and said to him, I know what you meant. You meant that Obama's policies led to ISIS being found, you know, that, that, that's, that's what you were saying, and you're totally right about that. And Trump said, no, I meant what I said. Obama is the founder of ISIS, and didn't explain what he meant by that. So 
sort of um, really um, resisting any attempts to kind of, you know, be palatable or understandable, but just kind of saying what you want to say, um, which is what I, I argue that's a case of, of bullshit. And about the second thing, yeah, I'm familiar. Um, I think we're talking about the same paper. That's, uh, um, in fact, that's what I, I read and, and caused me to at first reach out to, to Dr. Lasser. And um, basically, I, I, I agree. I think, I think we're arguing pretty similar things with, with somewhat different terms. Um, yeah, I think there is this connection and, and it's not um, politically symmetrical, but uh, you found it in Republicans, which makes sense, but I would argue, um, or this would this would imply that the reason for that, or at least one, is that Republicans are much, much more populist than Democrats are in the current incarnation in American politics, or at least that's part of the reason. Um, but yeah, I really like that uh, gateway sort of metaphor. That's useful. Thank you, Avishai. Uh, Alan, I think was next in a question. Hi, uh, thanks so much for the talk. Uh, I just wanted to check in. I think it's just clarification, really. Um, the kind of problem that you set up at the start, this idea that it's kind of interesting that populist politicians say so many things that are demonstrably false, but still manage to have a reputation for truthfulness. Uh, and then the idea that maybe we can understand that by distinguishing two different things that might be involved in truthfulness, the accuracy versus the sincerity. Um, one just brief point is that I, I, I feel like the, the same challenge would arise even once we focus on sincerity, right? It it's doesn't, certainly maybe this is specific to the UK context, but it doesn't seem plausible to me that the more populist politicians are even saying things that they sincerely think are true. Um, so it's not just that they're not worrying about accuracy, but they don't actually believe a lot of the things that they're saying. So, so I would have thought that the same problem will still arise, mm -hmm. even if we just focus on the sincerity part of truthfulness. Yeah. How can it be that someone, who, particularly if they're saying different things at different times or saying things that we know that they know aren't true, how, do, how is it still compatible with them having a reputation for truthfulness? Um, so that was my instinct anyway, but my actual clarification question was just whether the empirical data that you presented did bear out an answer to that problem that you set up, or is that something that, because I, I found it very interesting. Um, so I'm wondering if whether the kind of studies that you showed us here does help to answer the question of how, how there can be that disconnect between someone's reputation for truthfulness and what they're actually doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or, or is that, or, or do you think you didn't manage to get there yet and that's the future work? So I, I didn't, uh, th thank you, first of all. I'll start with the second question. I didn't manage to get there yet, but what I was presenting here was my um, MA thesis and I, I, I want to go back to it and develop it and hopefully turn it into a paper um, after expanding it. Um, so I'm, I'm very open to the possibility that I'll, I'll find something else, but basically I didn't, I didn't find that, but you know, there are lots of caveats, the corpus, because I was relying on a corpus that coded um, speeches as the unit, of, even though I was coding accuracy and sincerity at the level of the sentence, but the populism score was at the level of speech. So, th so the corpus really wasn't very big. And um, I mean, it was enough to, to have statistical significance, but uh, I really would have liked it to be bigger and lots of other possible problems. So the short answer is no, I didn't, I didn't find it. What I found was this intermediary explanation of the type of speech which, which is interesting in my opinion, but um, doesn't directly get to the heart of what, um, of what I was asking. Um, as for your first question, um, I, I have the same instinct as you do, and that's kind of why I um, took, why it's so important for me to stress that I'm not talking about sincerity, I'm talking about appeals to sincerity. So I'm certainly not arguing that, that Donald Trump or populists in general um, is sincere. Um, I'm arguing that they're doing rhetorical things to signal uh, to people, hey, listen, you know, I, I am sincere. And, and you're right. I mean, certainly a, a, an observer can look and say, well, I doubt, I doubt that as well, because you said something else yesterday. So how could you be sincere? Um, and that's fair enough. You know, there is sort of a danger in these things between looking at Trump too much versus other people, because Trump, he really is kind of 
uh, Sue Generous or how, um, you know, he really has a personality where you really, I, I at least, I really don't know if he knows what he's saying is true or not. Like, it seems to me that he, he might be sincere in the, in the sense that he really is convincing himself um, that what he says at the moment is true and that's it. Um, but I'm, I'm not trying to claim that in general for all populists. Like, I think that's more of a personality thing. Um, so the more general claim is that there, it's a type of discourse that's um, that's appealing to sincerity. In other words, it's trying to signal people, hey, at least now, right now, I'm I'm telling you what I'm really thinking, and um, and and mentioning what I said yesterday that that's that, that in itself is kind of an appeal to accuracy. Like that's that's sort of irrelevant to what's happening at, at the moment. So it's very sort of um, it's very present um, sort of thing, which is another sort of interesting component of it, I think. Thank you. Thanks. Angelo. Yeah, uh, thank you. Very interesting presentation. Uh, go, go, going back to this issue of the essential link between populism and post-truth, I think that the link is there in the moment that the political actor and the historical protagonist of populist uh, is, uh, is, is invented. It's something that doesn't exist when they talk about Americans or uh, the, the true Finns or the real Germans or the people who wake up early or the, these, uh, the disfavored sectors. Like who are these people, right? So as they these people do not conform a, a, a well-defined collective, they can invent and they must invent an, a, an autobiography for this for this actor, right? And that's the root of the problem. They start inventing uh, a, a, a narrative to justify the existence of this political, invented political actor, right? And that happens both in the in the in the right wing and in the left wing. Uh, for instance, in discourses like "women want because men are," right? That is also a populist speech, even if your uh, your your presentation have been very focused on the right wing, and in particular in Trump. And I think that is a, a problem. I think I'm, I'm, I'm detecting that problem in the study of misinformation, in the study of populism, in the sense that it is becoming this, uh, the, the Trump studies, right? Like we have like Trump studies, and everything is uh, around Trump. And the thing is that, as, as you said in your last response, Trump is very special. He's a very special guy in the sense that he doesn't have an ideology or an ideological corpus of beliefs. So if you look at other populist movements, for instance, in Argentina, in Spain, in Italy, in Finland, Germany, they tend to have other form of discourses more motivated by strong ideology, for instance, uh, nationalism, for instance, left-wing identity politics, or local stuff like Peronism in Argentina, uh, Bolivarian uh, stuff in, in Venezuela. So I think that may be affecting the analysis of the discourse because we, what I'm, I'm noting is that we are trying to extrapolate the linguistic style and the cognitive, very, very fringe and special fact up cognitive style of Trump to other uh, Con, uh, cultural and national context, and I am I'm very very skeptical about that because populists they, they share this notion of the uh, the the people versus the elite. Uh, they share this invention of the people, who the people are, the good people are, but it it it, it varies a lot, uh, and especially in the terms of language and 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 ideology, right? Yeah. Um. Yeah, so I mean, the second point about kind of Trump versus everyone else, I think, it's, yeah, it's an important one. I certainly um, it didn't hide, rather the opposite. I, I shared um, that Trump was my motivation, and, and I started from there. You know, I set off on this research literally on uh, November 9th, I believe, 2016, the day after the election. I was like, I want to study this. Um, but uh, the study itself is, is not about you know Trump. It's about um, populist leaders, or rather, it's about political leaders from all over the world and how populist they are and how they aren't. Um, now, it's true that Trump is is one of the ways in which he's unique is that he's 
ideologically all over the map and other populists aren't that way necessarily. But the leading conception of populism in political science is that it is in itself a thin ideology. It's true, as you said, yes, oftentimes they're also nationalists or they're also socialists or something. They latch on to other thicker ideologies, but populism is, is, um, is conceived of as something that's pretty thin. It really has just this one central idea of the people versus the elite. And, um, and, and this is something that's shared by, and it's true that Boris Johnson certainly speaks differently rhetorically than Trump does. And, and, um, and so does, you know, Bibi Netanyahu and many others do, um, which is that a problem? I mean, it might be to me, it was what made it an interesting question. Well, I, I, I think theoretically there is a reason these populists should be the same, but it's true that in terms of style, they're not. And like, let's see whether they are. And, um, and I'm still curious about it. I'm not sure. Um, as for your first point, I thought that was actually really interesting. So a very early version of this paper um, was very structured very differently. And instead of saying, I'm arguing that populists are, are, are bullshit as sincerity, as I call it, it I was just throwing out several, um, or not throwing out, but I was laying out a couple of different explanations. And one of them I called bullshit as symbolism. And I think it was very much similar to what you were saying, which was basically the argument was, you know, all ideologies need to communicate some kind of worldview. And um, some ideologies can point to real facts. Um, I'm not saying they're 100% true, but still they have some history or something to point to that's, you know, that, that um, they're basing their state of nationalism on. But populism is perhaps especially really based on something that's quite um, imaginary, not in the sense of being fake, but in the sense of really not being um, something you can see with your eyes. And, um, and in that sense, basically the argument was populists are more symbolic in their speech because they need to connect real things that happen in the world to these wider abstract concepts of the people and the elite. And for that sense, and for that reason, they're talking symbolically and symbolic speech, it doesn't have to be a lie, but it is by definition speech that's less concerned with being accurate or not, because what it's concerned with is doing something else, it is conveying some kind of symbolic meaning. And I, I, for what it's worth, I think that's true as well. I think these explanations are, um, are, are both part of the picture. It's not the one I focused on here, but um, I think there are a lot of reasons. And um, yeah, I, I, I think I, I agree. Okay, uh, I think we are right on time. It's just 2 p.m. here on point. So thank you very much, Avishai. Uh, very interesting talk and um, good luck with your PhD. <laughs> Thanks very much. And thank you very much for everyone for having attending here. And I'll wait for you well, for next week appointment. Okay. So thank you very much. And bye bye. I'll see you all. Thanks.